The first event of the uh, of 2018, uh, we are going to because next month is our annual mega code um, um, and pit crew practice sessions in the skills. We're, we're going to go over CPR science, cardiac arrest. I'm also going to talk about some. I think minor changes to the standing orders um, and a couple of housekeeping kind of things and a few um, different um, case reviews which all relate mostly to mostly to cardiac arrest kind of things. So right in the batch talking about cardiac arrest and uh, we are going to be working to make um, to make our experiences in um, OTEP and PSEP count for your quote merit badges in uh, uh, in ACLS, etc., just like we do for trauma, um, which will save some things. Now, I'm not going to speak to the crowd here, but I'm just going to pre-warn you that some other changes are coming soon because um, National Registry has changed their rules. And National Registry is now allowing you only 10 hours per period of distributive learning, which means watching the tapes. So there's going to be, of that 48-hour 40 refresh, refresher, you can only count 10 hours of tape review. So it'll have to be on, it'll have to be in person. So we'll, we'll, we'll be talking at the next QI meeting about how we're going to adjust that. Uh, we may be going back to the two days, every, every lecture have two different days available so there's, so that all the shifts can have the oppor opportunity for learning. Uh, at any rate, uh, more news at 11, as they say. So the principles of high performance CPR, EMTs, and you guys are EMTs even though you are EMTPs, EMTs own CPR. We're the, still the best people to do CPR. If you want to have, if you want to have a heart attack, if you want to have a cardiac arrest, do it in front of a fire station or an ambulance station. Uh, minimize interruptions in CPR at all times. Ensure proper depth of compression, which is now 2 to 2.4 inches. Uh, now, 5 centimeters. Are you going to, you know, are we going to measure? That's why we practice, 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 practice with a feedback machine. Now, there are devices out there that will give you feedback, compression depths. Um, we don't have a lot of those. So it, for us, practice makes perfect. The uh, uh, Seattle Fire, when you watch them work, any one of them can reproduce a perfect strip every time on any mannequin, on anything, and uh, we assume that applies to people too. Ensure full chest decompression recoil. Ensure proper chest compression rate. Our rate's 100 to 120. We like to say 110 is a nice number right in between. Rotate compressors every two minutes so nobody gets fatigued. We hover over the chest, getting ready to compress as soon as the patient has cleared before the shock, after the shock. We're trying to reduce this to less than 10 seconds, less than 10 seconds. Intubate and place advanced airway with ongoing CPR, put an IV or an IO with ongoing CPR, coordinate teamwork between the EMTs and the paramedics. The EMTs own it, though. So high-performance CPR. Establish unresponsiveness, pulseless 
APNIC, we're having the telephone, uh, the, the dispatchers do not ask now, hopefully, what, whether they simply say, are they breathing normally? That way, agonal respirations are still treated. You know how to do CPR, one hand in the middle of the chest, uh, other hand on the back, lock fingers, push down, two to 2.4 inches, 110 per minute. CPR is the foundation of resuscitation, and high performance CPR improves the effectiveness of defibrillation and effectiveness of medications. The likelihood of ROSC in return of spontaneous circulation increases significantly with higher mean chest compression rates. So studies show people get ROSC with 90 or more chest compressions compared to only, compared to uh, 72 or fewer chest compressions. So it still has not been quote, scientifically proven which is the best. And people are saying, well, maybe we can do 90. And you know why they want to do the 90? It's because the Lucas machine can't exceed 90. ROSC decreases with compression rates above 130, though. So the sweet spot is somewhere between 100 and 130, and 110 seems to be as good as any. If you're at 120, you're fine too. And remember, if you're at 120 per minute, <coughs> and you have a, and you do two, you do a set of 200, which is little less than two minutes, and you take a 10 second pause for for interpretation of the 12 of the EK, of the rhythm strip and perhaps giving a shock then your rate is actually effectively only 110 so that's what we're trying to do better compressions lead to better organ perfusion so greater depth of compression increases the likelihood of a successful shock compression equals Organ perfusion, you push down and you push blood forward, you perfuse organs. Decompression produces negative interthoracic pressure, sucking blood into the heart, into the thorax, into the heart, so you can compress and push it forward. Um, you need to have enough Compression, decompression to be able to get your uh, aortic pressure. The difference between the end diastolic aortic pressure and the um, right ventricle pressure has to be about 25 in order to be able to actually pump blood forward effectively. Pausing makes a difference. The longer the pause in chest compression, lower chance of positive um, outcome. Here's the very simple uh, experiment. This was pigs. I have to say they didn't do this with people. These were pigs, and um, a they had literally 100% resuscitation if their pauses was only were only three seconds. If their pauses were 15 seconds or more, uh, they have only 40% uh, recovery. Now, you say, Shit, gee, 40% recovery in V-fib is pretty amazing. Actually, we, we actually approximate that for witnessed V-fib arrest. Um, but this is a totally controlled thing, so you expect <coughs> resuscitation so the only, the only difference here is the time of pauses. And, and the time of pause is very simple. I mean, makes sense because during that pause time, there is no coronary flow because there's no difference between in diastolic aortic pressure and 
right atrial pressure. So there's no flow whatsoever through the coronaries. So your coronaries are not being, so you know, 15 seconds of no coronary flow, you start killing more heart muscle. Doesn't return. The longer the pause preceding the shock or following shock, lower the chance of survival. Um, Sheldon Chesky, who is one of the researchers from Toronto, has done some really nice studies on that. And um, this is why we, tr we teach the system of telling your evaluator defibrillator when you reach 180 to start anticipating that they have to do something. At 190, we charge the machine, and at 200, you come off. There's no pause then, just, and, and you should be able to see V-fib in about three seconds. Deliver the shock. That could be a five to six second delay then. Even if you take seven minutes, seven seconds, seven minutes, seven seconds to evaluate that rhythm and you deliver a shock, it's only 10 seconds then. Incomplete de decompression, I've already mentioned it, inadequate blood volume in the heart and lungs, 75% um, decompression doesn't provide enough coronary or cerebral perfusion to achieve ROSC. Yiannopoulos is a very interesting guy of uh, obviously uh, Greek extraction. Uh, uh, he runs the he runs the research cardiac research lab at the University of Minnesota, um, and they're they're the ones who are who are taking selected persons in refractory V-fib into, they put them on ECMO, um, essentially heart-lung bypass, and take them to the cath lab. And they've got reasonable results from that. Now the patients are all transported to the hospital using a, um, a, a Lucas machine to do compression because you can't you can't do really adequate CPR in the back of a moving rig over any length of time. Um, inadequate decompression compromises both coronary and cerebral blood flow. Even limited periods of incomplete decompression has a lingering effect. It lasts. I mean, you just don't have coronary flow. So the Canadians say they don't call it adequate. They say don't park or camp on the chest. So you have to have complete decompression. Okay, what about medications? Medication is the last thing, and it's still the most important thing, is early CPR, early defibrillation for the person who's in uh, cardiac arrest f with a shockable rhythm. Perfusion is the mechanism that circulates medication. The better perfusion, the better circulation. Good CPR decreases by about 200% the amount of time required for circulating blood when compared to poor CPR. Now, the takeaway for me on this one is also that because good CPR maybe gets you 30% circulation. It takes a long time to get from a very peripheral vein into the general circulation. What's the most peripheral vein that we do? It's a IO in the, in the tibia. So the most proximal vein that we do is actually the humeral head. So if you're in a, if you have a cardiac arrest, if I had a cardiac arrest, I would prefer that you do an IO. If you have to, if you're going to do an IO, if you can't find, can't find a good, uh, a good uh, antecubital vein, do an IO 
in the humeral head. Good. We, we showed in the, one of the side studies that occurred out of the ALPS study was that there was a slight decrease in ROSC, a trend to decrease in ROSC from IOs compared to IVs. And that's because almost all the IOs in the, in the ALPS study were in the tibia. It takes about a minute and a half to get from the tibia into the general circulation when you're doing low flow states like CPR. So if you can't get it into the, into the humeral head, obviously the tibia isn't, but anticipate your medication is not going to do anything for a minute and a half. Early defibrillation studies, all, every study out there says AED shock by bystanders for initial VTAC, VFib arrest is associated with greater survival and greater survival with good to excellent functional recovery and results in the use of less medications. And we have our own, we have several cases of our own where people go down, witnessed in a, in a, generally in a, in a uh, uh, gym-like situation where they have an AED, they have people that recognize they went down, they put the AED on, they shock. Um, last, last lecture, uh, one of our case reviews was the 15-year-old girl who went down at school, the bystanders, which happened to be school nurse and the, and the uh, sheriff, put an AED on, single shock, she was back in a perfusing rhythm. Of course they use less medication then because when do we use medication? When they're refractory to shocks. All right, one of the side effects of the, one of the things we did find in the Rock Alps if you had a witnessed arrest with a shockable rhythm, those patients, the rate of survival to hospital discharge was significantly higher with either amiodarone or lidocaine, about the same, no difference, than with the placebo. So give or take, almost 28% of the people survived in a witnessed shockable rhythm, refractory to the initial shocks, but who got lidocaine or amiodarone. So 28 out of 100 went home, whereas only 23 of 100, so five people per, per 100 difference. So it does make it, it does seem to make a difference. And it was consistent across both amiodarone and lidocaine. Now, then, paper we just published, whether, whether or not the arrest was initially shockable or not, if they ultimately became shockable and then were refractory, there was a consistent trend towards survival with either lidocaine or amiodarone. Actually, amiodarone was a little bit better in this one. They were not statistically significant, but there's a definite trend, which we can see. So this goes to, so if you, if you're, if you get there, patients in PEA or asystole, you get with epinephrine, et cetera, you get them back to a shockable rhythm, you shock them, they stay in that shockable rhythm. It does pay to give them some amiodarone or lidocaine. We use amiodarone. It seems to make a difference. Yeah. Uh, to that previous slide, from my math skill, according to one, uh, it seems like the bystanders are really good. Since they're so terrible. Um, what, what is the reason that we're doing amiodarone and still lidocaine? Lidocaine is easier to push, you don't have to draw it up, it's metabolized, seems like, really, really in the body. 
well, one of the side effect one of the side effects of uh, in in the original ALP study, one of the side effects of that we were able to when you when you looked at when you looked at the numbers of all the of all the uh, side effects, we were able to predict without knowing which the drug was, just by the side effect which drug had been given. Uh, so the patients with lidocaine had more seizures afterwards, and the patients with amiodarone required more pressor support. Um, and that was the significant difference. So you know, there's no, there's no, it's true, there's no great difference. Now, why do we use lidocaine, why do we use amiodarone instead of lidocaine? Because we use amiodarone for other things too. Um, the problem is the formulation we used in the in the ALP study is not exactly the formulation that's available commercial, um, and there there are some downsides. But we do use amiodarone for um, for VTAC now. We use it for pulsed VTAC. We use it, you know, and we, it's it's much more useful for treatment of. Uh, Atrial arrhythmias, particularly if you have wide complex aberrant conduction, so uh, that's the only. That's really the only thing. If you if you decided right off the top of your head that oh I want to use lidocaine today, I wouldn't have any big argument about it one way or the other. But I prefer you to do really good CPR and stuff beforehand and not have to get to give medications. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> it's not, but we <laughs> we're we're not even going to have an office by the end of the month. <laughs> okay. So survival from v, VF VTAC after initial non-survival out of hospital cardiac arrest is poor, but not negligible. So that's why we continue. So the whole point of, of, of having an asystole is to try to get them to either to come back with an ROSC spontaneously or get them to a point where you treat them for a shockable rhythm. Teamwork, teamwork. Teamwork is the key. So collaborate, communicate, coordinate. Increase focus on using a team approach during resuscitations. You do interventions simultaneously, minimize interruptions in compression, clear communication. High performance CPR begins with the e foundation of EMT CPR. Advanced cardiac life support is layered on it with a teamwork by the EMS crew. So pit crew approach is what we have elected to do. Now, it's simply an organizational method for managing resuscitation with predetermined assigned position responsibilities. The number one priority, though, of all personnel is to maintain high quality CPR. Minimal interruptions, no interruptions less than 10 seconds. You may have to adapt the pit crew. The pit crew was designed for cities, that had adequate response. They had a minimum of five to eight people responding to a code, ultimately. When you have smaller responders, smaller number of responders, you adapt the pit crew to what works. So pit crew CPR can only happen when you get the patient to a place where you can actually get five to eight people around them. So in a tiny little bathroom with the guy stuck behind the toilet, you can't do pit crucible, you can't do anything in there. Well, you can do anything, that's why he was in there. Uh, if, so if they're limited rescuers, North Country, a few at a time, CPR and defibrillation are the first priority. All other activities are accomplished with additional resources. 
Incident command principles are followed. That's the fire, that's fire-based incident command. So, basic, first, first arriving paramedic is the team leader for the resuscitation. First arising company officer is the, quote, fast attack incident commander. It's not something I am comfortable with, uh, fast attack. They're responsible for the non-medical management of the scene, safety, and liaison while assisting with the resuscitation. Second arriving company officer, strategic incident commander, non-medical management of the scene from the tactical IC, remaining strategic but uninvolved in resuscitation if possible, if there's enough people. He's the one who's going to plan your egress mostly. Position one. Compression, determine cardiac arrest, pulse, pulseless apneic, etc. Expose the chest, begin compressions, announce when you're at 180 and then 190 and 200. Now that takes practice to get, first of all, you've got to be able to count. And you have to be able to remember to do that. And all you're doing is warning the guy who's going to be in charge of the defibrillation and evaluation. Position two is life pack. Turn on the life pack to time stamp it at the begin for the beginning of CPR. That's when we say you are beginning CPR, at patient beginning CPR. The metronome is generally built into the machines. Keep the metronome on. It helps you to count. Apply patches. Now, I prefer AP placement. I think it works better. If you're having, if, if in, in the hospitals now, if all the, all the manufacturers for cardioversion recommend AP placement, I think AP placement catches the heart much better. But I am ver very well aware that Sometimes you don't have the ability to do that. It takes a little time to pull that shirt off, roll a giant person over, and be able to put an AP patch on. So you do what works. But I think we're going to get better result with AP. Now. If you haven't put it on, if you've already given them three shocks in the refractory, if possible, put AP, change it and put AP on. You know, in, in Portland, in Portland, they drag in another, another monitor defibrillator and put AP patches on, and then you have two, and then they give, try to give simultaneous shocks. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. First of all, you can't give simultaneous shocks. No machine does, you know, push that button, no one really does simultaneously. Um, and I think it's just that they now have an AP placement. But uh, Dr. Jew disagrees with that, although, you know, so at any rate, my money is go to the AP. We're not going to drag another monitor in right now. Um, so, monitor compression quality, speed, time intervals, charge the monitor at compression 190, so this is 180, the person in charge of that defibrillator, number two, charges the machine when you get not 190. At 200, you come off, you look at it, if it is not a shockable rhythm, dump the charge. Put them right back on the chest. If it's a shock, if it's a shock of a rhythm, shock. Put them right back on the chest. Another compressor. Alternate doing compressions. Now, so position two, if there's only two of you there, position one and position two can alternate if you're going to get tired out. Now you say, well, wait a minute, am I going to put a, well, it depends. You have to say if you've got Two medics, two paramedics, that's easy because you can read the machine. And there are only two of you there. Your machine should be in what? 
path, it should be in AED mode. That way, an EMT could do it. Machine will read it. Say, shock or nut shock. Position three, airway. First thing, O2 via nasal cannula at 10, 10 to 15 liters per minute. That gives you apneic ventilation potential. Then BVM ventilation after the first defibrillation. So in the first moment of being there, you need just compressions. Now, you can put an eye gel in after the first or second defibrillation, so you've gone through at least one sequence. Provide ventilation, try to do ventilations on the upstroke so that when they're decompress when they're in the decompression, now it probably doesn't make any difference. And it doesn't make any difference once you get a decent airway in, such as an eye gel. Attach the ETCO2 to the eye gel, you can tell if you're really getting ventilations then. Suction is needed. Intubation should be done if you need it for airway control. It doesn't interfere with compressions or you get ROSC and you are transporting the patient and he's not awake and talking to you. You don't need to intubate him if he wakes up and says, get off my chest. Position four, compressions, alternate compressions. So now we've got four people there. Position five, IV and IO meds. Now that might be position number two if you only have two of you there. One IV attempt, if you can't do it, do an IO. Remember, practice, practice, practice. I'd like to see more in cardiac arrest and trauma. I'd like to see more humeral heads. We need to do more practice. You may have to practice every month to feel happy about it. If you're 100% sure that IV success is unlikely, then go right to an IO. But you can do that by observation. You know, if they don't have any arms, you're pretty well sure of that. And you probably can't do, an, a, humor, you do a humoral I, IO then either. Administer required medication. Position six, the strategic IC. This is the one who's really not involved with the actual mechanics of CPR. He's safety, he, she is safety, liaison with family and other agencies, getting medical history, getting drug history, etc. Develop a plan for egress. Position seven and eight, backups. They're there to be assigned as needed. So this is kind of the positioning uh, schematic of the positioning uh, with your uh, strategic IC and your backup folk hanging out below. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I think it works better with the compressors to be on either side so that you can switch off. But it, that makes no difference. Practice, see what works. In the hospital, I always like to have one on one side, one on the other, so there's no delay. But if you can really scoot around, you know you're, you know you're gonna have a five to 10 second delay before you have to start compressing again, so you can move. After the incident, now this is where we are falling down lately. Company officers should debrief the crews after each cardiac arrest crew and determine where improvement can be made in the application of the operating, standing operating procedures. All personnel, and that includes all personnel in the case, so that by, by argument then, by inference, that means AMR and 
fire should review the CPR process, the CPO file, and determine how CPR can be, you know, you do a hot wash of the incident to decide what went well, what could it be, what could be better, and even, even if you get ROSC, there's almost always, in any human endeavor, there's always something you say, well, you know, I might have been able to do this a little bit better, even though you can't argue with the outcome. So, remember, EMT zone CPR, minimize interruptions in CPR, ensure proper depth of compression, 2 to, two to 2.4 inches, ensure full chest recoil decompression, rotate compressors every two minutes, hover hands, be ready to compress as soon as the patient is cleared, intubate or place advanced airway with ongoing CPR, place IV or IO with ongoing CPR, coordinate and teamwork between EMTs and paramedics. Our walk cares is our cardiac arrest registry to enhance survival. Um, Oregon, uh, most of the Portland area now is on a CARES system also. Salem, I think, is on a care system now. Um, it's developed to help communities determine standard outcome measures for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest for quality improvement efforts and benchmarking capabilities. We have a data tool that allows us to trend Identif trend to identify trends, to have training opportunities, compare with other national sites, but it's imperative that our data input is accurate, which is what we depend on you to fill out your charts adequately and also to have the PCO file. These are the current care sites. Um, although they've been expanding into sections of California, sections of uh, Arizona and uh, New Mexico. So it's, it's getting around, it's getting to be a pretty much of a standard. So this is our, this is our summary of Clark County out of hospital arrests from 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016. So we've got four years of this. The pink is survival to discharge. And you can see that the linear, the, dis, the survival to discharge has been trending upward. Now, you say, well, not a huge amount. Well, this is, um, 14% to 19%, almost 20%, uh, which once again is a difference of six persons per hundred. Um, our sample size is not huge, so you can't make a lot of determination on that, but, and you can see that our sample size has actually decreased since uh, uh, 2013. Um, which we're, I guess we can only interpret not as many people are having cardiac arrests or, or calling us um, in that amount of time, and I don't really know how to explain that part. Uh, our ROSC has gone up, our survival to admission has gone up, although it, both of those trended down a little bit, but not significantly with, with our N number. Um, in 2016. Now, just empirically in our gestalt right now is that our uh, survival to discharge rate is, is actually decreasing this year. And we're not 100% sure why. We have a couple of, couple of thoughts and I would be happy to have to entertain any comments from any of you as to anything you've observed on cardiac arrest and it may be just the demographic of the patients uh, they may be they may be have more comorbidities they may have you know, it may also be the fact that we are not doing the alp study right now and there's a whole advantage of people 
knowing you're, you're being looked at to how you perform and wanting to perform to something. Yep, all all the patients that had intent uh, intention to treat intent to treat. Yep. Mm-hmm. So. Oh yeah, oh yeah. No, no, no. These are these are these include all the intent all the treated who were in asystole and and never got out of asystole and you left them. <laughs> no, 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 and and. And no, and these are only, these are non-traumatic cardiac arrests. So, so the criteria for WACARE's um, submission for medical only cardiac arrest, cardiac specific, is any time an EMS provider instituted CPR. There's even a, even a category, so if you institute CPR and, and they stick, throw out a pulse form or a DNR order, and you stop, there's a criteria for that as well, and that's measured a different way. But any time an EMS provider institutes CPR, it gets included in the walk care. Does that include the narcotic poisoning? No. Nope. Right. It's just a narcotic poisoning are not counted. So the, I, I, the caveat with this is really it's, it's imperative that you, that you and most of the time it's actually, you guys do an excellent job of giving the reason because there's typically a question, reason for a call or reason for arrest or whatever the question is. Um, most of the time you do a pretty good job of that, I don't have to guess. So it's, if there's clues on scene that say this is, this is a traumatic event, this is a, you know, and sometimes it's not so obvious, or this is a medical event, it's important to know the difference between the two. And the other thing is, with your charting formats, there's a there's a question in there for cardiac arrest on estimated time of arrest. That's a data point that I have to fill out. You have a better idea of when that is than I do by reading your chart. And that's a data point that needs to be filled out for every one of these cardiac arrests. Because we have to know we have to have to know something educated on when right. you think their arrest time. And it doesn't make sense if you, if somebody says to you, if a bystander says, family member says, well, I last saw him at 11.30 last night. Well, now it's 6 o'clock in the morning and you have a, a guy that's in V-fib and, you know, agonal respiration. So, uh, he probably didn't go into cardiac arrest at 11.30 that night. So with your best educated guess, I need to know when you think you went into cardiac arrest. So I'm done. Thanks. You can say greater than 10 minutes even or whatever or, or give a time. Need you need a time, yeah. but if they if it's a witnessed arrest, you can put the time that they called. Okay, uh, really quickly, just uh, covering a couple of cardiac things out there that we see. We've got the. The life vest, the life, the Zoll life vest, and I think there's another manufacturer now, is a wear, wearable defibrillator for patients at risk for sudden cardiac arrest, where their physicians haven't yet decided that they're going to take them to uh, to the cath lab and put in a, a an implantable uh, internal cardiac defibrillator. Um, I, I'm always a little bit curious. Uh, there, there's, there's sometimes a couple. Sometimes some very good reasons for not doing that, but um, I, I'm not sure um, other, other than insurance why that sometimes occurs. Uh, but some patients are not good candidates for, I, if you're not a good candidate for a cath lab, I guess you're kind of in trouble anyway. Um, it's non-invasive, consists of a garment and a monitor. The garment detects arrhythmias, delivers treatments, and shocks, monitor, monitors rhythm, contains the battery. You can be shocked by this device yourself, just like you can be shocked by any defibrillator. Now, will it kill you? Probably not. Will it surprise you? Definitely. 
Don't touch the patient when a shock is being delivered. The life vest warns you and any bystander with a siren alert and a voice command saying electric shock is possible, don't touch the patient. Bystanders do not interfere. It gives you a warning. It's just like your just like your partner. When your partner says, I'm clear, you're clear, we're all clear, that means you're not touching the patient. Can you use an, ec an external defibrillator while the patient's wearing a life vest? If the thing isn't functioning correctly, yes. Disconnect the monitor from the electrode belt. What if the patient feels a vibration coming from the vibration along with the alerts and prompt, voice prompts? That's part of the life vest trying to figure out if the patient's conscious. So they can press and hold the, the buttons to, to avoid a shock. Now, so if the machine, if the thing is vibrating, it's going to give a shock, stand off at that point if the patient's unconscious. This machine's trying to wake him up and see, hey. So, a couple tones. If it's silent or a single tone, or if it says contact the physician or treatment has been given, call your doctor, that means it's monitoring the patient and, it may, and it's alerting the patient to follow instruction on the scene. If the patient's unconscious, you're watching the screen and it says, hey, I'm going to treat this patient. Treatment's been given means they're mm -hmm. already been shocked. shocked. If there's a two-tone siren alert, it means if the patient's not responsive, the voice will say, call for help, perform CPR. Or device disabled, call ambulance. That's what will tell the caregivers. That means the device can't detect the, the rhythm or the device has delivered as maximum amount of treatments that it can. Some, some of these devices are set to deliver six, some of them are set to deliver nine consecutive shocks. Remember, these are very low dose shocks because they're, they're, they're external, but they're, they're not the same as your, uh, it's probably less than 200. Two-tone siren alert with a voice saying press response buttons to delay treatment or there's a vibration or it'll say electric shock possible, don't touch patient or bystanders not, do not interfere. It'll say any of those things. That means it's detected a ventricular arrhythmia and it's going to shock the patient. So stop CPR at that time, stand back. If the patient's alert, awake, they can press the response button to stop it. Standard evaluation treatment measures, CPR can be performed as long as the device is not broadcasting, press the response buttons or electric shock possible. If you're going to use, if you say this thing is just not working right or it's given all the shocks, remove the life vest by first pulling out the battery and then take the garment off and then you can use an external defibrillator. I'm not going to talk much about LVADs because they're all so different. The takeaway with the LVAD, is, and is, is anybody aware of anybody in there? Okay, we've got one over here, you've got one over there, and one, two over there. So we've got, and all, each crew, each, each area, each, the crew should be updated on what LVAD is out there in their area. And the LVADs all have a phone number to call. And you need someone on the phone talking to the LVAD coordinator who can troubleshoot some of that yourself. Most of the people, uh, their caregivers are, have, have been given reasonable instruction on how to troubleshoot. The LVAD assists the function of the left ventricle propels blood to the ascending aorta, um, 
It uses an external wearable system that has a controller connected to an internal pump by an external drive line. It's powered by two batteries. It can also be plugged into a 110 power or 12 volt for that matter. Um, if a patient has a problem that has an LVAD identified, establish airway, provide O2 if any respiratory symptoms. It doesn't necessarily mean there's any problem. If they're having a medical problem, they have all sorts of medical problems. So they may not be having a problem with the LVAD itself. Do a thorough patient evaluation, including device function. So the, the major causes of problem may be infection, volume depletion, shock, stroke, bleeding, and dysrhythmias. Most patients are anticoagulated, so they're at risk for bleeding. Auscultate the heart sounds to determine if the device is functioning. If it's functioning, you should hear a whirring sound because not a not thump 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 thump, but because it's a continuous flow device. Therefore, you may not feel a pulse because there's no difference in the flow at any time in the where you normally feel pulses. Now, if you feel over the carotid, you may feel what's called a thrill. You may feel flow. Assess for other things, cap refill, mental status, dizziness, temperature, mo temperature of skin, moisture of skin, etc. Cool, clammy. ETCO2 is a good thing. Their ETCO2 is normal. It kind of, kind of indicates they're perfusing. Treat with fluids as needed, large bore IV. Your standard blood, you may not be able to get a blood pressure. So, in tidal CO2, and capillary refill, mental status, uh, pulse oximetry probably, whoop, probably won't be accurate because of the continuous flow also. Because the way pulse oximetry works is, it's a comparison between the colorimetric change between uh, systole and diastole. Now, an EKG will probably be reliable. You can tell if they have ventricular dysrhythms and V-fib may not be symptomatic because they don't depend on the heart beating entirely. If the patient requires defibrillation, leave the pump running, leave everything in place, but don't place the defibrillator over the, directly over the pump. Or if they have a pacemaker, don't put it right over the pacemaker either. Most of your pacemakers are up in your left-hand side anyway. So this is another place where you can use AP placement if you had to do it. All, any ACLS medication may be in there, any medication for anything else, any other medical condition that you have medication to treat. Don't perform chest compressions unless the VAD center, the ventricular assist center, tells you to do it. That's why you need to be on the phone with that, with that coordinator. Chest compressions if the pump isn't working. When you transport the patient, they go to the closest LVAD or closest hospital. So, Southwest can manage, in a pinch, can manage it. If the patient is otherwise stable, take them to where their LVAD was put in, which is usually OHSU. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, we have a couple patients in the area now who came from Seattle. So they'll end up going to Southwest. We're not asking you to transport to Seattle yet. Um, follow the advice of the coordinator for t to troubleshoot. Remember that the patient has to be supported by battery power, so transport the backup controller and the spare batteries with the patient. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. Did you follow that? When you cut your doses of epi or any other presser drug in half because if you get severe, if you get increased peripheral resistance too much, then the LVAD, it's a very low pressure system. It can't pump against it. Oh yeah, yeah, and yeah, and it's and it's and it's very worthwhile. Um, I think the coordinators have come out to Camas, they've come out to North Country, they've come out to Three, and given the crew's instructions. I don't think we have any any patients right now. Curiously, right in the in the city of Vancouver. Oh, okay. So, um, did the coordinator, did you have any contact with the coordinator? We should probably get in touch with the LVAD and have them come out to, at least out to eight. And give them, yeah. Uh, packets of information are one thing, but having somebody come out and actually give you a, you know, a first person, uh, and that way you get to know who the, one of the coordinators at least. I mean, the coordinator is not going to be on 24-7, but, uh, you know, they have three or four or five that will rotate. But at least to know those. Uh, if they have a care, and the caregiver is trained too, so bring, bring the caregiver in along with you in the ambience. I, w I would I would do your standard uh, um, standard fluid challenges, um, knowing that um, the primary the primary problem that you're not having um, um, if if you have a if you have a volume depletion, you need you need to get enough volume into the venous side in order to to prime the pump, if you will. Just like anything else, it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's your venous capacitance that has the, you know, that you need to replace the volume to. Okay, uh, I'm going to hit our cardiac arrest protocols real quickly, and then we'll take a little break, uh, and then we got about we're about halfway done. Okay, continuous compression CPR will be maintained until ROSC or termination of code. This is your basic protocol. Now, I like continuous compression CPR. Now, I'll be very honest, the studies have not shown a significant difference between the, the old 30 to 2 and continuous compressions, except that as soon as you get an advanced airway in, all the protocols go to continuous compressions. And because we're putting the eye gel in so close, so quickly, with the CO2 monitoring, that's, that's in between, that's an in between advanced airway. That's really an advanced airway. Uh, it, 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 it gives better delivery of oxygenation and it doesn't seem to have the 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 blow by problem you do when you're doing uh, when you're when you're doing continuous compressions with ventilation most of the time I like to see and you'll note in our protocol that continuous compressions occur in your first sequence and I don't talk about doing any airway management other than a high flow O2 in that first round it's after the second round, it's after that first shock that I'm going to consider uh, adding BVM and adding an, event, uh, an airway device. 
Drug selection and administration is always based on the last analyzed rhythm. So during that time period where you're off the chest after you've had 200 compressions, you come off and they analyze the rhythm. If it's V-fib, then you do drugs appropriate to V-fib. If it's not V-fib, you consider drugs appropriate to that rhythm. Don't pause compressions to confirm rhythm unless the patient starts grabbing your hands right in there. So if you're, if you're at 100 compressions and the guy reaches up and says, stop that, I'm perfectly okay with you looking at the rhythm at that point. But otherwise, we look at the rhythm. In be we don't have a machine yet that does a good read during compressions. So, to recapitulate the VFib pulses VTAC algorithm, so a treatable rhythm. If they're unwitnessed, we do CPR for two minutes, then defibrillate as below. Now, if you arrive on the scene and you have bystanders doing good CPR, you can take a look at the rhythm immediately. In a witnessed arrest, ordinarily we mean witness that you witnessed the arrest, and those are the ones we should have 95% survival. Initial defibrillation, 200 joules, and I recommend, if possible, AP placement. If not possible, do the standard placement, and you escalate from that point on, you increase your output until you're at the full output of the machine. And, it, and the sequence in our machines is generally 300 to 300 is the next one, and then 360, full output. IV started, or IO, with salt solution, an eye gel, or an ET tube, if, it's, if that's appropriate. And drug therapy with each drug, CPR for two minutes, analyze and defibrillate as needed. First drug is epi, one milligram IV or IO. You can repeat epi every three to five minutes. CPR, analyze, if V-fib or pulses VTAC persists, and amiodarone brings up the question, how about lidocaine? I prefer, you know, it's in your orders, the amiodarone, so unless you want to come talk to me, we'll keep it with amiodarone right now. If you suspect an amiodarone, 300 milligrams, IV or IO, and repeat it, after three to five minutes, if they persist in pulses VTAC or VFib, despite shocks, despite that drug, if you're giving it IO, I'd let it go at least five minutes. And you can repeat it half the dose, 150. If there's torsades, or magnesium deficiency suspected, so torsades, mag sulfate, two gram bolus, IV, easy way to do that so you don't have to think about it, dilute it, and then run it wide open. Now, can you bolus it? Sure you can bolus it. You can't hurt a dead person. More, normally, you're gonna give Magnesium over a 10 to 20 minute period. I don't want you doing that in a cardiac arrest. You give it quickly. Continue CPR, analyze, defibrillate, repeat the epi doses as needed. If you get ROSC, maintain your O2 sat of at least 94 to 96, under 99. So 94 to 98. ETCO2 of 30 to 40. 35 to 40 would be better. Monitor your waveform. So, you make a decision whether you're going to transport the patient based on a number of things. Uh, I could say, it, right now, we, we, we generally transport, especially if people have gone from VFib 
to an ROSC and then back to VFib, we generally transport those. Uh, uh, if you get an ROSC and you transport the patient, you should have your, if they've been in VFib, make sure you keep the patches on them and be prepared to start doing CPR and shock en route because they probably do. Now, is there a, I'm trying to analyze a couple of different scenarios or different uh, um, um, papers. It may be if we have someone who goes in and out of VFib, you've already given them, or if you have ROSC, it may be reasonable to consider giving them a dose of lidocaine to keep them stable. I haven't decided, there, there's conflicting evidence out there. I'll, I'll bring that back to you at some point. Asystole, straightforward. Determine asystole, continue CPR, IV, ET tube, or an eye gel, capnography throughout. If the patient braided down in front of you, then you might consider putting a pacemaker on. Or if you gave them adenosine and you failed to check to see that they were on um, uh, anti-seizure meds and uh, they go to an asystole, you, know, you may give them, you can pace make them, a, pace them at that point if you caused it. Um, Drug therapy for asystole, straightforward. Epi, a milligram IV or IO, repeat every three to five minutes, continue doing CPR, monitor that. Uh, try to get your O2 sat in the 94 to 96%, particularly if you get ROSC, you wanna keep it at that level. Follow your protocols if you have ROSC. PEA, also straightforward. IV, IO, volume, chal volume challenge now for PEA, because it may be due to volume depletion. Eye gel or an ET tube, capnography, treat the cause, we'll look at the next slide here, and then epinephrine, if witnessed, if they brady down on you, you can start, you can consider a pacemaker, but what will a pacemaker do? The thing is already you know, unless they're bradycardia, you can consider a pacemaker. Um, the cause of PEA can also be the causes of any cardiac arrest. Hypovolemia, you treat that with volume. Cardiac tamponade, uh, well, we, we haven't had the need, we haven't seen the need to continue training on, on uh, 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 cardiocentesis. Um, so the trick is to drive fast, get them to definitive care, but uh, tension pneumothorax, which is much more common, needle decompression, hypoxia, you ventilate the patient, drug overdose, if there's an antidote, such as Narcan, um, hyperkalemia, got a hyperkalemia protocol. Acidosis, ventilate the patient, which is the better, and if, they, if you think there's profound acidosis because they've been in a cardiac arrest forever and you've been doing CPR forever, or because it's a near drowning, drowning kind of situation, uh, um, or if it's an arrest due to asphyxia, you might consider that they have acidosis and they could use a little bicarbonate, but generally ventilation treats most of your acidosis. With a massive MI, they need pressor fluids, et cetera, pressor and fluids. So if their left ventricular output is, zero, is very low, they need norepinephrine. Um, Massive pulmonary embolus is treated primarily now with embolectomy, sometimes with TPA, but mostly embolectomy. And actually, we've had a couple of cases that with good CPR, we've gotten return of circula uh, spontaneous circulation, and they've gone to, to uh, interventional radiology and had an embolectomy. 
Uh, hypothermia, obviously you warm the patient. Post-resuscitation, if you're going to transport the patient and they're not awake, I want them intubated, even if you had an eye gel in. Now, if because of the personnel, if because of issues you can't intubate the patient, mm, if you're going to ever, if we ever get to the point where we would transport any of our patients on a Lucas type device, uh, which I'm not advocating yet, um, then they have all those patients have to be intubated. Um, if they're persistently hypotensive after now. Remember, anybody who resuscitated from a cardiac arrest is going to have hypotension to start with for that first one or two minutes at least. If they persist in hypotension beyond, let's say, four to five minutes, then they probably need a fluid challenge first. And if they're refractory to that, particularly if the systolic is less than 60, so their, their MAP is significantly less than 65 then they need norepinephrine and start out at four mics and work up. 12 lead, if you identify a STEMI, they follow STEMI protocol, but all patients post-resuscitation are going to end up at Southwest anyway. Okay. Any questions? All right. Let's take at the most a 10 minute pause. Hey, uh, some protocol changes. These are mostly, these are protocol changes for the paramedics. Couple of just, you've already heard most of this, so I'm just gonna refresh on ketamine for RSI sedation. It's two milligrams per kilo with a max of 200. For pain control as an adjunct with fentanyl, 0 0.3 milligram per kilo over two to three minutes, the max of 25 in each dose. But I want you to have given at least two doses of fentanyl. Now, Multnomah County requires 200 milligram or micrograms of fentanyl to be given, and I'm not going to require 200. So if you gave two 50s and they, you know, if it's a reasonable sized person, um, then you can sneak the fentanyl. Now, a lot of people are, are getting nervous about the use of ketamine um, because of, uh, they say, well, you get increased nausea and this, that, and the other thing. Well. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's been our experience at all. Uh, so we'll just keep monitoring it. I will monitor all uses of ketamine. Um, but now for pain control directly, and th this, this comes, I, I basically have adopted what the military says, because the military uses ketamine a lot in the field now. Um, for pain control, particularly if you have hemodynamic instability, which means a MAP of less than 65, uh, 0 0.3 milligrams, so the same dose as we do for an adjunct, but it's given by itself. Give it IV or IO over two to three minutes with a max of 25, or, and this comes from the military, because they don't always have an IV in there, a milligram per kilo IM for pain control. You can repeat that every 30 minutes to control pain or the endpoint of too much ketamine is nystagmus, agitation, and we've had one case at least recently where the person was really wacko or ventilatory compromise, just too much sedation. Ketamine doesn't generally compromise your ventilation because well, it's just when there's too much. So we want to use it sparingly and with some, with control. Like I say, I will monitor each dose, each, not each dose, but each time you used it. 
No. CPAP. Some minimal changes. Pre-hospital indications are primarily congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema of any cause, respiratory insufficiency of any cause, such as asthma, COPD, pneumonia, CO poisoning, works really nicely in CO poisoning, decreases, decreases your total time to clearance by at least 300%, one third is a long time. You can use it in pediatrics if they're able to cooperate and tolerate the procedure. Obviously, a little kid can't do that. Contraindications, absolute contraindication. Don't use it in cardiac arrest, diagonal respiration. Duh. Don't use it if the patient's unconscious. If you know you have a pneumothorax, it's not a good idea to have increased intrathoracic pressure, back pressure on the, I mean, intra intra-bronchial pressure, because you're going to increase that, pneumo make, make the pneumothorax a tension pneumothorax. Facial anomalies, so burns around the face, fractures, that's the things that makes it difficult to hold that mask on, facial trauma. Relative contraindication is a decreased LOC. I don't know how many of you have gotten to the hospital and you say, well, gee, I wish I could have put a, this person's not very much awake. They're, they're a little bit, you know, they're, they're, they're semi coma but they're really short of breath, and I wanted to give them more, and I was giving them positive pressure with a bag valve, and the RT puts a BiPAP on them, and it works well. You guys are, your paramedics, I trust you, you know when a person is not doing well on a CPAP. So relative contraindication is decreasing LOC. They're decreased LOC because they're hypoxic and hypercarbic. Claustrophobia, so that's a relative thing. We can deal with it. Patient intolerance to equipment. Uh, a tracheostomy, if you don't have the right adapter for it. Uh, pediatric patient who can't tolerate the procedure, who can't cooperate with you. Hazards of CPAP, gastric distension, corneal drying, hypotension, and pneumothorax. So COPD and asthmatic patients don't respond predictably, so it requires paramedic judgment to do it. The higher risk of pneumothorax, Assess lung sounds. If they're not doing well, quit. Increased central thoracic pressure with hypotension. So if you get increased, you decrease venous flow and the patient becomes hypotensive. How we can manage that is sometimes by reducing the ventilation rate and volume, particularly in asthma. In asthma, you shouldn't exceed five centimeters of pressure either. So put the face mask on, put an O2 device per the manufacturer. Pressure sets it, starts at five centimeters, or you set it for five, and adjust it up. Don't exceed 10 with the CPAP. Reassess patient every five to 10 minutes. Consider mild sedation. So mild sedation, if they can't, uh, a good thing is ketamine, 0 0.3 milligrams per kilo or versed. Now, maximum number of the 0 0.3 for sedation is 25. If you can't maintain the SpO2 over 90%, go to PPV with a BVM. And PEEP valve, which we're going to come up next. Remove the face mask for suctioning and for nitroglycerin uh, for bronchi uh, bronchodilator administration uh, for MedNebs, you have a MedNeb attachment for the CPAP, so you don't have to remove the mask. PEEP. The indications for PEEP are hypoxia, pre or post intubation, despite appropriate positive pressure ventilation. So the, the, the th times that you will really consider using it are people who have congestive failure. 
Contraindications, cardiac arrest. Relative contraindication, existing hypotension. Because PEEP may decrease, may increase your intrathoracic pressure, which will decrease venous return. Now, you can use PEEP also often to prepare a patient for RSI if they have a low SpO2 already. And when we get the RSI thing, we've got some additions that include that. Precautions, hyperventilation, increases the intrathoracic pressure and hypotension, and it increases the risk of barotrauma as well, pneumothorax. Put the PEEP valve to the bag valve device. For congestive failure pulmonary, start out with a PEEP of five centimeters, bag as usual, it can increase by five centimeters every three to five minutes until you resolve hypoxia. Max PEEP is 15 centimeters of water. In COPD, asthma, and obstructive lung disease, though, start at three centimeters and increase by three centimeters to a maximum of nine, so less than 10. Remember the max on your, on your CPAP was 10. Maximum pediatric pressure is five centimeters. Try to maintain a MAP greater than 60. All right, a couple of changes on endotracheal intubation. That we, we simply added a few things which you already knew but made it easier to understand or to follow. Indications for endotracheal intubation include respiratory insufficiency, airway obstruction, unable to protect airway, and a GCS of less than eight, or anticipated clinical course, for example, airway burns, anaphylaxis, et cetera. Preoxygenate the patient uh, if they're less than 90, uh, SpO2, do a BV assi B BVM assist with 100% O2 until you get to 94%. SpO2 greater than 94% nasal cannula oxygen only. I like for patients who are in a cardiac arrest to do apneic oxygenation if there's no obstruction, so put that nasal cannula at 10 to 15 liters per minute. Suction is needed. Now, when you're intubating the patient, I want you to start thinking about these. Position patient head of bed elevated to 15 degrees. Now, if you can't elevate the head of the bed because the patient is a trauma patient, elevate the entire gurney. Put them in what's called reverse trend. Remember, Trendelenburg is tipped down. Reverse Trendelenburg is tri tipped up. That also makes it easier for you to intubate. Align the ear with a sternal notch. Okay. No changes in atropine, no change in lidocaine, except that we use lidocaine for patients only with re uh, reactive airway disease. It's not indicated for head injury anymore. Uh, uh, and if it's if it's too cumbersome for you to do it, I will not beat you to death if you don't use it. You don't have to come see me. If you say, hey, but you should probably let me know, reactive airway disease, I didn't use it because um, didn't have time. It's time. Um, automate uh, is your, still your preferred um, uh, uh, sedative for intubation with an alternative of ketamine, two milligrams max, uh, two milligrams per kilo with a max of 200. Now, I recommend it, considering it for status, for reactive airway disease, and the patients who are in shock due to trauma or cardiac or sepsis. Now, you notice that Versed is not there as a preferred. Now, if you have nothing else to use, if they say, oh, if the, there's a tag on them that says, I'm allergic to Atomidate and I'm allergic to Ketamine, okay, you can still use Versed, but write it in as, an, as a, as, let me know that there was a problem. 
if Versed is not considered now. Now, RSI, we use sucks with an alternative rock uranium. We can still get it. There's a couple places in, in um, Washington that they have run out of rock uranium and, and can't get it, and they have to go use another alternative, which we worked out for them. We haven't had to do that yet. Rock uranium would be indicated if the patient, if you knew the patient was hyperkalemic or highly suspected it because they're a, they were on a furlough from their, um, from their uh, dialysis, um, or myasthenia gravis, things like that. Um, no other changes. Uh, succinylcholine is still our, still our, dr our drug of choice, though. Uh, if intubation is repeatedly unsuccessful, insert eye gel, or if unable to ventilate the patient with the eye gel because of patient trauma, severe angioedema, you can't get the eye gel in, et cetera, uh, then we have to do, consider a crike. Treat bradycardia with atropine, no change. If no ETCO2 reading or deteriorating waveform, pull the tube and reattempt. Post intubation, now here's the change. Post intubation, midazolam for sedation. So if the patient starts moving around, sedation, 2.5 to 5 milligrams of midazolam if the MAP is at least 65. May repeat. If agitation or combativeness persists after sedation or if their MAP was low, Fentanyl, 25 to 50 mi milligrams every 10 minutes as needed. Case in point, the last lecture, the, the young woman who had a cardiac arrest was successfully returned to spontaneous circulation, did not wake up yet, was RSI and intubated was given sedation, she began still fighting the tube, got 50 mics of fentanyl, totally quiet, went the entire way to, to Portland to a pediatric uh, hospital. Another case, a cardiac arrest, fighting the tube, got a long-term sedation took forever for us to figure out whether the guy was going to wake up or not. I would much rather see them have the low-dose fentanyl so we can sort it out. We're not doing definitive, I'm going to send you to the ICU on a ventilator in the field. That's not our job. Our job is to get them to the hospital in a good state where we can finish up the evaluations. Now. So then, the change is, whoop. okay, we didn't get this one in here. So I only want you to use long-term paralysis if it's really indicated. So by the time you've treated with Versed and with fentanyl, most people in in Vancouver proper will probably be at the hospital. So you probably don't need to do long-term paralysis. I would not use long-term paralysis if you're trying to see whether you're, to, just to maintain your airway on a patient who's a cardiac arrest, if you can do pain medication and sedation to maintain them. When you do long-term paralysis, we have, so the orders are, are, are going to be much more restrictive for the use of long-term paralysis. Okay, uh, change in flu season only. This is just a, this is our SOPs. Person that, you know, we are flu season now. Flu season has been officially declared about three weeks ago, four weeks ago now. Uh, so we do have available, uh, if you have 
badges and you've had your shot to, to get the little sticker thing which will get you into the hospitals. Personnel who are not vaccinated against the flu and how effective is the flu? I did look it up for the thing. The current estimation for the effectiveness of this flu is between 40 and 60 percent. The, there's a 6 percent number out there, 6 or 10, 6 percent or 10 percent number out there, which comes from Australia, and they were only looking at the effectiveness against um, H3N2, which is only one of the flus in the thing. The, the three-pack is not as good as the quadrivalent, the four-pack. So if you're going to get one, get the four-pack. So we estimate 40 to 60 percent. It's hanging right around 40 right now. Uh, but that's because the H2N3 hasn't come in. Um, so we'll see how this works out. Uh, nevertheless, if you've had your flu shot, uh, even if you get the flu, uh, it decreases your, uh, it supposedly decreases your length of symptoms and severity of symptoms. We'll see how that works out. If you get the flu, you're going to have to have a fever. If you get the flu, you get flu symptoms with a fever, get started on uh, antiviral medication, Tamiflu or one of the others. So personnel who is not vaccinated will follow standard infectious disease prevention during patient encounters, including wearing a mask for any patient contact, entering any closed space, including a private residence, SNF, clinic, patient transport vehicles, or entering all hospital facilities. You will be asked to put a mask on if you don't have one on, if you don't have your little sticker that says, or some way of identifying yourself as having this shot. And I, you know, we trust your judgment and veracity to be honest about it. Uh, big deal. Put a mask on if you didn't get, if you don't want to get the shot, no one can make you do that. I'm not going to talk about suds. Uh, that's really a issue for AMR anyway. It's, nothing has changed. We draw, we draw a blood sample, AMR should draw a blood sample on any sudden, uh, any sudden unexpected death, including ROSCs, and refrigerate it, fill out the paperwork, turn it in at their office. All right, we have some fairly interesting case reviews here. Anybody have any questions on the orders before we move ahead? We'll send out a, we've already sent out a summary to your agencies of the, of the changes so you don't have to remember everything I said today unless you come to my office. <laughs> okay. Can I ask, what, yep. what is the current edition that got it? Is it July 17th? Yeah, and so you should. Ask that question again. It's July or August of 17. The current. Yeah. Okay, priority one, dispatch on an unconscious 78-year-old male at a fitness center. The employee at the facility says he was downstairs, he heard a thud above him on the second floor, he ran upstairs, found the patient lying behind the rowing machine with a pool of blood around his head. He began CPR after calling for help, did a round of CPR until an AED arrives was applied, staff states they shocked the patient one time and resumed CPR. Arrived to E9 arrives, find the patient lying supine on the floor, behind the rowing machine, CPR in process, pool of blood, approximately 100 cc's. Uh, GCS, of course, is three. CPR is going on, an eye gel is put in size four. Um, IV is started. 
blood glucose is 100, CO2 is 51, because that eye gel is in there and working good. Epi is given, went right to the thing because one shock had been given, and he continued to be in apparent arrest, so that's the correct thing. And you know, if one shock's been given, you know the machine said it won't shock unless it's VFib. Got epi. Then it says shock number one, but this is shock number two, your shock number one, ventricular tachycardia. Got some more epi. Could have had amiodarone at that point. Shock number two, then got amiodarone. Came back with an ROC, blood pressure 165, heart rate 88, uh, MAP is 128, uh, gets full spinal precautions because you got this whack in his head and blood all over the place. Uh, extricated down two flights of stairs. Um, we got some midazolam for sedation and then had spontaneous ineffective respirations. Um, GC, the B, blood pressure is falling, et cetera, decided to intubate. He's not awake. Intubated. Got succinylcholine, uh, intubated, lung sounds are cleared. Transported, gets pulseless electrical activity, gets CPR, got some more epinephrine, continued pulseless activity, so arrest, arrest, arrest. Gets to the hospital. Interesting case, um, really nice work in the field, lots of rounds of CPR, including in the ambulance. This would have been a good case for transport with a Lucas device that can do CPR for you in the back of a machine of a, of a rig. He maintained ROSC in the ED, but required an epi drip to get, keep his blood pressure up. Because he had so much issue with, you know, his, his 12 lead is actually, I've looked at his 12 lead and I think he had an inferior MI. Um, it wasn't a, it's not 100% conclusive, but in this setting I would certainly say that. But because he was so unstable, they didn't think they could, you know, the, the intensivist didn't think he could take him to the cath lab. So they stabilized him. He went under uh, therapeutic temperature management, hypothermia protocol. Uh, in 24 hours, he's moving all four. He was extubated, did reasonably well, a little short-term memory loss, um, and a little aggressive behavior, um, which responded well to medication. Ultimately, after about three days, four days, he had a PCI ended up with getting two drug eluding stents. And his wife said, I, wanna, I don't want to take him home because I'm scared. So they put him in a sniff. As far as I know, he's at home now. I, don't, I think she was afraid because of his medical problems, not, because, not afraid of him. <laughs> uh, so um, it's, a, it's a good case. And it, but it goes to show that you know you don't always respond to the first AED shock or even the second. <laughs> now, here's a 25-year-old male found pulses and apneic by his wife. Wife states the patient took some oxycodone before going to bed. Minutes later, she found him unresponsive with no pulse and not breathing. Dispatch start, had her start CPR. He's found in the bedroom, supine, pulses, and apneic. Dusky cyanotic extremities, compressions, continued BVM ventilation. Pupils were noted to be slightly constricted. Given the first dose of Narcan at two milligrams. Eye gel was inserted. Ventilation is positive capnography reading of 25. An episode of emesis with minor purposeful movement. Additional Narcan of four milligrams was given. And within minutes, 
had another episode of emesis and coughed up the eye gel. Able to answer all questions correctly, loaded in the rig during Trenton. Now, this is not put into our cardiac arrest statistics. This is not part of the CARES thing because this is a narcotic overdose. During transport, IV established, given fluids, did not headache, dizziness, chest pain, dyspnea, abdominal pain, does remember taking oxycodone prior to falling asleep because he wanted to. Good reason. He didn't say how many he took. He took enough, took enough that it took, you know, basically four milligrams of Narcan. Um, patient's extremities, Continue to be dusky. Now, um, so, blood glucose, okay. Uh, okay, he's now, he's, in, in this one, he is now awake and talking to you, and he has a pulse ox of 54. He gets oxygen at six liters per minute. Anything else we could have done for him at that point? Anything else? What's common after uh, a narcotic-induced respiratory arrest with treatment with uh, naloxone? Non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And you know, his pulse ox stays low. We managed to get him all the way up to 83, which isn't normal. So, this is a great case. Uh, he ends up in the ED with an O2, SpO2 of 80% in the ED, 83, the last on the EMS. He had pulmonary edema on exam and on films, which is just adult respiratory uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, non cardiogenic pulmonary edema from the arrest and re expansion after eating Narcan. Prob he may have had some aspiration pneumonia too. Uh, he did well in the ED and the hospital on BiPAP, so he never did get intubated. <laughs> Turns out he has a lot of other issues. He has a clotting factor dis uh, deficiency at a previous DVT and pulmonary embolus, so and he's not been t he's been taking oxycodone instead of uh, instead of Coumadin, so he was put on heparin prophylactically, and then he's probably on Coumadin now, so he'll probably overdose on the Coumadin too now. But you'll probably see him again because he just wants to, you know, take his oxycodone in large chunks. And he's probably found somebody in the community that will write him a prescription for 100 or so at a time. Okay, dispatch code three in a cardiac arrest. Family says they were sleeping in bed, so the, the spouse woke up, patient not breathing. Denies that the patient is taking any drugs, but did have some alcohol. VPD was the first to arrive. They were simultaneously dispatched. The VPD had a defibrillator, an AED. Patient had no pulse, started CPR, put on their AED, which, which advised a shock, twice. So there was apparently really early arrival and then uh, the first, the first um, um, Fire or ambulance did not get there a long enough time that they got, they got time to get two shocks in. VFD arrives, and then on their arrival, the patient's in a PEA. So CPR, eye gel, pulse ox, glucose is okay. Uh, starts after after these things, uh, didn't require any medication, has a still GCS of three, blood pressure 129, uh, pulse 138, MAP is 94, got some naloxone IV, um, and then kind of bucking around, so ends up 
going to be transported, gets atomic, sucks, and intubated correctly. First pass. CO2 is 27, 12 lead shows a normal sinus rhythm, no evidence of uh, acute MI. Got some midazolam and transported. CO2 is now 32, so she's doing well. In the hospital, she's still comatose. Now, we have the advantage of having past history on her and there, and she has a she has an unusual history of seizure-like activity after alcohol or cocaine. Her urine drugs are positive for both. Well, positive for the cocaine, but we don't, her husband said she did have some alcohol. She, was not, she did not have a measurable blood alcohol. She has a history of unusual seizure activity and she's followed by OHSU neurologists. She has some anti-seizure medication. In the ED, she maintains her, her pulses. She remained comatose, but appeared to be having um, some odd tonic-clonic kind of mo movements, which were thought to be possibly seizure activity. She's given some Keppra and some phosphenitone. She should have been on Keppra. That was her drug of choice, uh, her drug from OHSU. EKG was negative times three. She's negative on all her enzymes. Her head CT was okay. And uh, in, she was ultimately transported to OHSU for further care. Uh, I've done follow-up on her. I had follow-up done by uh, Dr. Hanley, and uh, she, was, she was at OHSU for two days. They did sign her out, interestingly enough, as a non-STEMI. She's got normal coronaries. Um, they, she's, on, she's supposedly on medication, uh, but I did check also she has failed to make any follow-up appointment with either the neurologist or the cardiologist. Shocking, right? Um, now, the interesting thing about this is that I was, I was quite upset because be, between, the, between the ED, and, and see, it works always, between the ED and the, and the neurologist, they decided that, oh, the, the, mon, the, the, the AED must have mistaken this seizure activity for VFib. Impossible. Or the manufacturer would probably want to have some say about it. So we went out to interrogate the machine. And of course, by protocol, the battery had been changed. So there was no more record. So we're going to rewrite the protocol so that if the FD has or, in, or the sheriffs have a, have a, use an AED, that the machine is turned in and we interrogate it immediately before they have to change the thing. Because, you know, this is just an error. There should not have should not have occurred that way. The, 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 these AEDs do not make mistakes. They will not tell you to shock a patient because they're having seizure activity. Just like you can't do it if you do any motion to the patient. So, all systems have to, so we are, we are also, I am also taking care of educating the, all the ED docs to know that if you have an AED go off, that is, that is, considered absolute evidence that there was VFib. You can't write a murder mystery where you kill someone with an AED because it won't shock accidentally. All right. Uh, <laughs> this is the famous Chick-fil-A Chick uh, parking lot incident. Um, 
VPD, VFD are on scene beside a white pickup truck. They see VFD wrapping a patient's hand in gauze and are directed to, a, to patient number one who is laying on the ground outside the pickup truck, passenger side. He has his left foot propped up on the cab of the truck and there's a tourniquet, a, a manufactured tourniquet out of, out of the other person's t-shirt um, on the upper thigh. VFD is cutting it off and putting a sterile bandage on it because this wound is not pumping. Uh, it's an upper, upper anterior thigh. Patient, it's his birthday. He's 23. He and his cousin went to the shooting range to celebrate his birthday. On their way back, cousin, the passenger, releases the clip, didn't realize there's still a bullet in the chamber. Now, fires the gun through his own hand and ultimately through the patient's thigh. They drove in another few blocks <laughs> and then went to the Chick-fil-A. They could get a <laughs> snack, I suppose. And uh, one had a hole in the hand, one had a hole in the thigh. Um, they called 911. They say no drugs, no alcohol, and no animosity. Well, I believe the latter, but not the first two. So they had a tourniquet on, they took it off, they just put a pressure bandage on because this is not a pumping wound requiring a tourniquet. This is, and I was asked earlier, uh, do I approve of you guys taking off a tourniquet, even if it's been put on by the police, putting the addressing on and evaluating it? Yeah, that's what we pay you for. Um, he got some fentanyl, and then he became a little nauseated, or wasn't nauseated, started, so got some ondansetron, and then transported for a full trauma acti activation. Well, I'm not sure this foot fits a full trauma, but we've had a couple of, of leg wounds or uh, at uh, uh, non-compressible or poorly compressible sites that were, have been a problem in the past. So. It's no big deal. They, they always get excited. Even if you took them in as a trauma alert or a modified trauma, you would be seen immediately by the trauma surgeon, so it's not a big deal. And what did they do? Well, they cleaned the wound out and sent him home. He still has, he has some fragments in there, but that's all you, you know, you, you do more damage digging around to take bullet fragments out. People live with shrapnel all the time. If they get infected, comes out the come squirting out like a little splinter. Um, now, we are, no, this is Mark's comment. This is, we're surprised how they survive the shooting range if they leave with live rounds in a gun. So we're gonna give this one the Darwin Award for the year. Um, and we'll, we, we'll probably do a Darwin Award every now, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that actually the, 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 fir, the first drug overdose and the second seizure lady also don't get Darwin Awards, but, you know, it's a, it's a toss-up. Okay. So, any questions, any thoughts, any ideas? We will see you, we'll see you at, the, at, at the stations next month.